G'day, g'day, I'm Chase, or Blanga Reacts, and today we're going to be reacting to The Unknown's Mystifying UFO Cases. This is another sort of documentary by Let Me Know. Uh, you guys seem to love these, and I love these too. Uh, we've done a few, we've done a lot now, so I'm just kind of uh, rattling off each new Let Me Know <laughs> documentary uh, that he has done, because they're really interesting, and we learn a lot. Uh, so if you are new here, then be f feel free to... Uh, click like, leave a comment on and your thoughts on the video, and join the community. Subscribe, we're almost at 200 subscribers, and obviously turn on that notification bell. A lot of the people who watch my videos aren't actually subscribed, so if you are new here, please consider subscribing, it means a lot. Uh, and we are a growing community, and make sure you turn on that notification bell so you never miss a video from me, because a lot of the time uh, it doesn't go into the subscriptions box, so turning on notifications really just makes sure uh, that you get notified when I upload anyway. Let's get into it. I'm excited. The unknowns, mystifying UFO cases. So I'm curious. This is going to be alien based, I assume. So let's get into it. The unknowns, mystifying UFO cases by Let Me Know. Just let me know. Just let me know. It looked like a silver saucer. It was exactly what it looked like. It was like no higher than 100 feet from my car. Well, I know I was in I don't like the alien sound effect buzzing around my head. Uh, outer space because all I could see was stars and he said it looked like planets. It was illuminating the clouds and that's about what it looked like. It was white. Saw this bright, bright light. It's object that looked like a saucer or something. I It's jumping up in the sky and, and doing all kinds of kind of tricks and it was too fast for an airplane. It wasn't a helicopter and it wasn't anything that we had ever seen. I've never paid much attention to UFO sightings. I've read about the occasional incident, but my curiosity has never really expanded beyond those few cases. Also, let me know what, um, let me know documentary you'd like me to react to after this one, because there's, there's still got a few more that I could react to, but let me know your thoughts in the comments. ...occasional incident, but my curiosity has never really expanded beyond those few cases. I just find that far too often the focus of UFO stories is on the mystery itself, as opposed to the resolution of that mystery. Plausible explanations take a backseat to fantastical embellishments. There's a documentary on Netflix right now, and I'm using the term documentary very loosely, about a man who claims to be harassed and pursued by aliens. In one scene, he literally has someone bob one of those alien masks you'd get for Halloween outside a window, and it is played completely straight. Oh my god, what the fuck is that? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I can't even say this, but I can just imagine what it looks like. Oh, it's funny. <laughs> uh, it's going to be curious to see um, what incidents, because there's obviously thousands of UFO and alien encounters and incidents and stuff that, you know, a lot of them are probably fake, but some, a lot of people claim some of them are real. So it'll be interesting to see which ones he covers in this video. Completely straight. Oh my god, what the fuck is that? Someone get this man an Oscar, top tier acting. Shit. <laughs> Oh my god, what's it doing? Oh my god, there's an alien at my window. Holy shit. Oh man. Oh yeah, bring in the comedic music, that is... Oh god, no, oh. I think a chimpanzee could could even call that a hoax. Holy shit. Oh man. <laughs> we, the audience, are supposed to believe that this is a close encounter of the third kind yeah, when mate. it looks like a close encounter of the trick-or-treat kind. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, this documentary did pique my interest, and so I began to learn more about the UFO phenomenon. I hope this guy who, like, faked this alien thing did one with, like, Bigfoot and Sasquatches and stuff, too. Immersing myself in this expansive mythos, of which I only had a very limited understanding. Actually, has he done documentaries on, like, Bigfoot or Sasquatches or Yowies or anything? I don't know, that'd be interesting. I, he probably would. From the very start, I was taken down this convoluted path of alien abductions, government conspiracies, and alien experiments that read like rejected drafts of the X-Files. But every now and again, I came across something a bit more credible. Stories that were genuinely difficult to rationalize. Nothing that would convince me the Earth is a galactic resort, but mystifying stories all the same. To get you on the same page as me, we need to go back to the year 1947. Oh, he might cover cover the like Ros. Uh, it's like Project Blue Book. I think it's called. It's like a Roswell incident, maybe. But 1947. This this time, this period of time would be a lot harder to fake 
uh, alien and UFO things. It's still probably possible, but nowhere near as easy nowadays. I know very little about alien. I know like the, some of the major ones, but uh, my my knowledge is pretty limited in the subject. In the summer of 1947, news and government agencies across North America were flooded with reports of strange objects in the sky. This UFO mania was provoked by a pilot named Kenneth Arnold. On June the 24th, Arnold was flying over Thanks the Cascade Mountains in the state of Washington when he observed a formation of nine saucer-like objects zooming across the sky. Also, sorry, I won't be able to react visually to this, but I'll just go, go off the information that he's covering. Unbeknownst to Arnold, this innocent description would come to popularize the term flying saucer. The scintillating discoids appear to be traveling at a speed of some 2,000 kilometers per hour. Oh my a god. A speed yet to be achieved by any man made airplane yeah. in 1947. I was going to say, what? I think even now they go like 400 kilometers, maybe 400 miles per hour, like on a commercial flight. Arnold initially suspected he'd observed some secret military test flight but the US Air Force quickly denied responsibility and merely dismissed the sighting as some form of optical illusion. But it wasn't quite that simple. Not only was Arnold an experienced pilot, but his story was corroborated by a number of witnesses on the ground who all described a series of oval-shaped objects traveling at a tremendous rate of speed. Furthermore, other sightings had been reported days before and would continue for many days after. More than 800 cases in less than oh a my. month. Including oh. the famous Ross. What's it? Oh, was he about incident? The Roswell. Cases. Yeah. So eight hundred thirty. That's twenty a day. Am I wrong? I don't know. That's that's thirty. Whatever. Math is not in my brain right now, but it's a lot. Multiple per day. In less than a month, including the famous Roswell incident. Publicly. The US Air Force dismissed the sightings as nothing more than a combination of overactive imaginations and misperceptions of natural phenomena. But internally, the Air Force was just as mystified as the public and actually quite concerned. Hundreds of unrelated persons from all walks of life, including high-ranking military officials, scientists, engineers, politicians and professional pilots, reported uncannily similar experiences in the span of a few weeks both the public and the intelligence community grew increasingly convinced that something was hiding amongst the clouds. Yikes. It's also, it would be like 27.5 cases a day, I think. I don't know, I was doing the math in my head. <laughs> Probably not right. In late June of 1947, the Air Force covertly launched a preliminary investigation into the sightings as they suspected that some UFOs could be vessels of foreign or celestial origin. By late September, the existence of advanced aeronautic vehicles could not be eliminated. While the majority of cases could be ascribed to natural phenomena, the maneuverability and evasive behavior displayed by some UFOs defied all conventional explanations. Well, even in 1947, it's going 2,000 kilometers per hour. That is not even heard of. Like, that is the biggest, like, hole in this, in this thing. It was speculated that these seemingly mechanical UFOs could be part of some top-secret military project, either foreign or domestic. It was feared that the Soviet Union had seized German technology after World War II and developed some advanced aircraft capable of covert infiltration of US airspace. I don't think this is I, th I don't think this is during the Cold War. I don't know when the Col I forgot when the Cold War began. Um, but I don't think it was in 47. That's ju yeah, it's just after World War II. This led to the formation of Project Sign a classified investigation that would attempt to determine whether or not UFOs posed a threat to national security. While the project members entertained a number of plausible causes, by the summer of 1948, a minority of credible and well-documented UFO cases could not be resolved. These cases became known as the unknowns. By process of elimination, Project Sign therefore concluded that the most probable explanation for the most inexplicable of cases was the extraterrestrial hypothesis. In other words, the unknowns did not appear to be from this Earth. Also, let me know if you guys believe in aliens or 
intelligent life outside of our planet because i mean uh, there's a massive debate on it and also i think this video came out like years ago i'm pretty sure it's at least three could be wrong but his content has like always been fantastic even if it's like a lot older than the stuff he posts now knowns did not appear to be from this earth however once this report reached the pentagon it was rejected the interplanetary explanation was thought to be unsubstantiated, and so the report was ultimately scrapped. Project Sign was dissolved soon thereafter, and subsequent investigations ultimately failed to ascertain the nature of these unknowns. Project Sign's successor, Project Blue Book, merely Ah, boom, that's the one I got. <laughs> Mentioned that earlier. Nature of these unknowns. Project Sign's successor, Project Blue Book, merely concluded that it was statistically improbable that UFOs represented technological capabilities beyond our own. As the vast majority of UFO sightings are misperceptions of natural phenomena, the presumption was that all UFO sightings are likely to be misperceptions. As such, Yeah, but how can you say that when there's so many things that don't add up with the technology of your time and of your planet? Like, come on, bro. It's what I hate about some governments. They just, like, <laughs> dismiss, like, ah... Oh, Oh yeah, aliens, we're aware, but let's just tell the public that they're not even real and it's nothing, nothing to worry about. Funding for UFO research could no longer be justified as the threat to national security was evidently non-existent. Government-sanctioned UFO research officially ended with the dissolution of Project Blue Book in 1969 and the Air Force has since proclaimed the issue resolved. Out of the 12,608... But you didn't resolve it though, you didn't just find out what it was, you just said could not be determined, like... Sense proclaimed the issue uh, resolved. Out of the 12,618 UFO reports in its collection... Say set, that again. Out of the 12,618 UFO... 12,618 sightings slash reports. Bro, what? ...reports in its collection, 701 were marked unknown upon its conclusion. Although... Set, That's still a lot. <laughs> it's like, what? 8%? Some would argue that many cases were mischaracterized and that more than 1,700 cases should be regarded as unknowns. While the US government may dismiss these unknowns as mere statistical anomalies, the fundamental question remains. What did people see? What mm. kind of natural phenomenon evades resolution despite decades of scrutiny? Because a lot of people can just say there's no evidence, there's no legitimately like concrete evidence that people have interacted with aliens or alien spacecraft or anything not of this world. That's That could be like a main argument, but depending on who you asked, we have. And I mean, I think there was like this Canadian politician who like said we've been living amongst aliens for thousands of years and there were like three different species and like the tall whites and other stuff like that. So... It's such a weird topic because you could talk about it for hours and go over all the different sightings and evidence and everything, but you can't really get to a like a unanimous conclusion. Ah, oh, this is coming. <laughs> Late in the afternoon on May the twenty fourth, nineteen forty nine. Six civilians were on a fishing trip on, on May the 24th, 1949. Six civilians were on a fishing trip on the Rogue River in the state of Oregon. Suddenly, one of them observed a round and scintillating object in the sky. It barely moved as it silently hovered some 1500 meters above. It was difficult to discern any details with the naked eye, but fortunately one of them had brought a pair of binoculars with 8 times magnification. The binoculars revealed a clearly eight times magnification. Why would you bring that to it? I mean, I guess if it's in Oregon, I guess they could be like, I don't know. Again, American geography stumps me, but it could be like grizzly bears or deer. So you need to like look out for your surroundings, but it wouldn't be the on the top list of things I'd bring on a fishing trip. Really distinguishable metallic craft of unfamiliar design. It was round and flat, about 10 meters in diameter, and had a rounded fin on the roof. It had a reflective silver-colored surface that appeared to be somewhat dirty. It lacked any conventional means of propulsion and made absolutely no sound. 
After some two minutes of ops. Those are the last two. Those are the main scary things I found about UFOs. No legitimate signs of propulsion. So there's no way it can actually propel itself anywhere in any way. There's no engine. There's no thrusters. There's nothing. And then no sound. That is... Uh, and the fact that they can just go anywhere, like, super fast. It's creepy as... Observation. The UFO gradually moved in the opposite direction of the wind until it disappeared with the speed of a jet plane. <laughs> Besides the corroborating accounts and detailed Spook. sketches, what makes this case so interesting is that two of the civilian observers were also employed at an aeronautical research facility, so they had ample knowledge of aeronautics. Furthermore, the story never reached the public. This is important because if this was a hoax, one would expect the hoaxers to seek media attention, yet the witnesses refrained from speaking to the press. The I think it was in like a Shane Dawson video or something. There was like um this person who claimed to find a, have a ufo sighting and he was staying in a hotel and there was security camera footage of these um men in black who walked in and they were all like decked out in a full tuxedo and they were like bald with head like hats on like the full dress to the nines nine yards um and they had like very mannequin like faces very pale and big eyes that felt like they were looking through you that's what they said during the security camera footage and they just walked in and i was like four men in black one was taller than the other but they looked identical um obviously to shut the guy up maybe who knows like i don't know there's too many unanswered questions with this kind of stuff bro story never reached the public eye until many years later when ufologists uncovered the case files which revealed that Project Blue Book had rather dismissively concluded it must have been a misidentified airplane or weather balloon. Well, there you go. It's just like casting it aside, not legitimately answering the, 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 I'm just going to say question. Couldn't think of the word. <laughs> so all we need now is a speculation in shaped like a pancake or a self propelled balloon unaffected by wind. <laughs> also, uh, I can see like the gender, um, like, different genders watching my videos and the where everyone's from kind of like i can see the country so i got like 48 percent american so hello americans i'm from new zealand <laughs> and also i think i skew like 98 percent 90 no i think it was like 96 percent male so although i think youtube's 80 percent male anyway so uh but yeah so i can communicate way easier with you guys using the youtube studio app on my phone so you know make sure you say hi in the comments make sure you uh reach out and uh yeah just thought i'd mention that in this video <laughs> Also, with his music, he makes a lot of it. He's got a Let Me Know music channel, and he, he makes a lot of the music he uses in his documentaries. It's very, very good music, too. Items on display include the latest in meteorological devices. The weather balloon is equipped with a radio sound, which permits measurement of atmospheric temperature, humidity, and pressure at various altitudes. God, he's got, like, the 40 radio voice. Later in the news, we're talking... <laughs> If you spend some time reading about UFOs, you will soon come across an explanation that is repeated time and time again. Weather balloons. Mm. The Battle of Los Angeles, balloon. The Roswell Incident, top secret balloon. Also, I think he's done a video on the Battle of Los Angeles, so... Why did I say it like that? Lo uh, LA. <laughs> the Battle of LA. I think he's um, done a video on that, so... If you want me to react to that, then leave it in the comments, and I will. The Mantell Incident, once again, a balloon. Unfortunately for proponents of the extraterrestrial hypothesis, it is often a rather convincing explanation. However, it is far less convincing when the witnesses of a UFO are themselves launching a balloon. On April the 24th, 1949, a, it's always the 24th. <laughs> a group of five balloonists had just launched a weather balloon in the New Mexico desert and were tracking said balloon with a special telescope. Suddenly, the person operating the telescope sighted another object in the sky and alerted the rest of the group who could all see the UFO with the naked eye. It had an elliptical shape and was white, silver, and yellowish in color. It was impossible to accurately determine its altitude and size due to the lack of reference points, but it appeared to be flying at an extremely high altitude and moved so quickly across the sky it was difficult to track with a telescope. It remained visible for about a minute until it suddenly stopped its horizontal motion and disappeared by near vertical ascension into the clear blue sky. It made no uh, sound and traveled crosswind. That's the thing, bro. If it can just go like this with no 
like wind affecting it or just literally defy gravity it makes no sense also with that 24 thing he's mentioned the 24th of certain months and i'm pretty sure in the db Cooper, he was like on the afternoon of november the 24th i think it's all november the oh just the 24th that's spooky i don't a know a year prior maybe i'm just pointing out things that really don't need to be pointed out <laughs> no sound and traveled crosswind a year prior a very similar incident had taken place on the 5th of april Three ah, balloonists okay, in good. the New Mexico Not desert 24th. were observing a weather balloon when they spotted a UFO moving at a very high rate of speed. It had a round shape and was white, grey and goldish in colour. It flew erratically across the sky and performed vertical loops for about 30 seconds until it disappeared. The desert was completely silent, yet the UFO violently manoeuvred without making a sound. Then a See, that's not a weather balloon, bro. Like... <laughs> On January the 16th, 1951, two balloonists and a number of pilots and civilians in the New Mexico desert observed two UFOs in the vicinity of the balloon they were observing. The balloon had reached an altitude of 35 kilometers, and even though it was about 30 meters in diameter, the two UFOs were about three to five times larger and appeared to be flying above the balloon. They had an elliptical shape and were white and gray in color. They orbited the balloon for about 40 seconds until they disappeared into the distance at a terrific rate of speed. And these are just three examples of many similar cases, and despite the fact that the spectators involved could not have been more qualified to identify aerial phenomena, none could explain what they had seen. Ah, oh, spooky man. What do you guys think? Do you, have you had a UFO sighting? If any, if anyone watching this video has seen a UFO, then please comment because I will read it and pin it. I will pin your comment. Or even just leave your thoughts and I'll probably pin it. Whoever has the best comment and I'll heart a bunch of them too. Because <laughs> I can do that now thanks to the YouTube studio. Hope. Spooky boy music. Just before midnight on July the 19th, 1952, radar scopes in and around Washington, D.C. picked up a cluster of 5 to 10 unidentified targets. There were no scheduled flights in the area and the UFOs did not adhere to any established flight paths. Is this before the ban on flight paths over Washington? I'm pretty sure that's a thing. I think that may have been after 9-11. Not sure, but I'm pretty sure, yeah, it must have been after 9 11 because I think there's a no fly zone. You cannot fly over the state of Washington. The possibility see. of a malfunction was quickly eliminated as radar scopes at three separate airports displayed the same unidentifiable targets. Eventually, the objects could be visually confirmed as orbs of light slowly moving across the sky. After a while, the objects began to fan out, zooming across the night sky of Washington, D.C. They flew above the White House, the Capitol Building, and many other restricted areas in a disorganized and unpredictable fashion. On numerous occasions... Oh, I don't like it when they threaten the, the uh, world's superpower with spooky orbs of light above the government buildings. <laughs> the UFOs performed sharp 90-degree turns, and some would completely reverse course in a matter of seconds. Radar operators were baffled. No man-made aircraft could perform such maneuvers. Air traffic controllers, radar operators, pilots, military personnel, and countless civilians all reported sightings of UFOs. One pilot mm -hmm. remained in close proximity to the UFOs for about 14 minutes, describing them as white lights with no recognizable shape. While some lights flew in parallel to the plane, Others appeared to be flying outside the Earth's atmosphere. The sightings by the pilot also coincided with a radar detection, suggesting that these were indeed physical flying objects as opposed to radar misidentifications of some kind. After more than three hours, two jet fighters were dispatched to intercept the UFOs. But moments before they arrived, the objects accelerated to speeds in excess of 10,000 kilometers per hour and disappeared out of sight. 10,000 kilometers per hour. Bro, that's not even... This is what I don't get, man. This It's so unanswered. I don't know how to react because, like, how do you add to this? I mean, I can react to it, but, like, how do I give my opinion? Because it's, it's unanswered. Like, how does any human explain that, you know? However, 
when the jets returned to refuel, the UFOs returned, returned to the skies. Yep. Oh man, they're playing, they're playing uh, chicken with you. <laughs> five hours after initial detection, the last UFO vanished from the radar scopes. Damn. That... But a week later... Because imagine that, you get, like, if you're an alien, you're going to go to the technically most powerful country in the world and scope out, you know, where the important people live and where the government, the people who run the world live. And uh, I don't know, it's creepier. There. The UFOs returned <clears throat> once more. On the evening of July the 26th, the numerous UFOs were observed streaking across the skies above and around Washington, D.C. They shared many similarities with the UFOs from the week before, appearing as orbs of light capable of extreme supersonic velocities. The crew and passengers of some commercial flights could once again visually confirm the existence of many of the UFOs detected by radar. Four jets were dispatched during the night, and two of the pilots did see something on two separate occasions. One pilot saw four white lights, while the other saw a single white light. However, neither came close enough to make an accurate identification, as the jets were easily outmaneuvered by the UFOs. The, the scary thing is, like, what else could it be? Because there's no way that's a weather balloon. Nothing in our known existence can go 10,000 kilometers per hour like it's not even like you can't explain that and that's the weirdest part of all of these sightings under mounting pressure from the public to explain this apparent invasion of the u.s capital the air force held a press conference on july the 29th now oh, this should be interesting we don't know probably a weather balloon <laughs> i am here to discuss <laughs> that's literally what he sounds like i am here to discuss those bloody lights we saw. Press conference on July the 29th. I am here to discuss the so-called flying saucers. The Air Force interest in this problem has been due to our feeling of an obligation to identify and analyze to the best of our ability anything. Oh, and for closure for the public, because they don't know what could happen. ...thing in the air that <clears throat> may have the possibility of threat or menace to the United States. However, there have been a certain percentage of this volume of reports that have been made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. It is this group of observations of that we now are attempting to resolve. We can say that the recent sightings are in no way connected with any secret development by any department of the United States. Well, he didn't deny it, he just said... <laughs> We don't know what it was. It wasn't us. <laughs> At the conference, they claimed that temperature inversions were to blame. It's an atmospheric condition in which layers of warm air traps pockets of cold air, which can result in false returns on a radar scope. Conversely, the visual sightings were supposedly misperceptions of... I was going to ask about the visual perceptions. ...on a radar scope. Conversely, the visual sightings were supposedly misperceptions of stars, meteors, or strange reflections of natural sources of light. In other words, it- Bro, I don't buy that, bro. I'm sorry. I don't buy that for a second. It was all just a big misunderstanding, and there was no cause for alarm. It's a very odd explanation, given yeah, that it exactly. completely disregards crucial pieces of information. What about how it goes from 10,000 kilometers per hour, like just gone, and just defies, I don't know, man. It's been witnessed by so many people, I doubt it's just like, uh, I don't know, it's so weird. For one thing, visual observations and radar detections were confirmed to be one and the same on numerous occasions. When pilots claimed they had visual contact with a UFO, ground personnel confirmed its existence and location on the radar scopes. When pilots claimed a UFO disappeared, it simultaneously disappeared from the radar scopes. Yeah, so it wouldn't be two different things. You can't, you can't have two different excuses for the exact same thing just on, because of the way people perceived it. Another glaring issue is that temperature inversions occurred on a daily basis throughout the summer of 1952, yet unidentified radar targets only appeared on the two nights in question. Boom! Perf Thank you, let me know. 
debunk all of their BS excuses. Chanel at Andrews Air Force Base were not quite sure as to what they had seen, claiming they may have seen meteors or other natural phenomena. No, but the senior bro. air traffic controller at Washington National Airport was certain they had detected solid maneuvering objects while explicitly denying the possibility of weather-related targets. Like, do I want it to be <laughs> what they're saying it is? Not really. Like, I kind of want it to be aliens, but I don't know. It, <laughs> everyone, I think mo most people want to make contact, but I don't know, man. Furthermore, none of the radar operators agreed with the Air Force's conclusion. Everyone was certain they had been tracking metallic flying objects. Even the National Weather Bureau disagreed with the temperature inversion theory, claiming that such phenomena would appear as amorphous streaks across the radar scopes, as opposed to sharp, delineable dots. And the thing is, who's behind the scenes, like, trying to debunk this and say, ah, oh, weather balloons, or ah, oh, temperature changes, or temperature inversions, like, Whereas all these legitimate pe working people uh, who are, you know, somewhat close to the government, you know, denying their explanation. Like, why can't they all think on the same page? Like, is there someone behind the scenes trying to uh, deny this? Like, I don't know. It's, In spite of these glaring conspiracy, bearing contradictions, the Air Force concluded that temperature inversions were to blame and that nothing extraordinary had taken place. Though somewhat paradoxically, the Project Blue Book files list the case as an unknown, while simultaneously agreeing with the Air Force's conclusion. There you go. And I mean, if they did happen on a day-to-day -day basis, why didn't everyone report them all the time? And if so, like, say that didn't happen, this is obviously something that no one has seen before. So if it happened on a day-to-day -day basis, no one would have caught up. They'd be like, oh, look, look, Johnny, weather things up there. They would have, you know, they would have actually, I don't know, it doesn't add up, bro. I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> but you get my point, like, if, if it happened all the time, they wouldn't have caught up because they would have just recognized it. And especially flying over the White House and government buildings in Washington, like, why not just fly over the Grand Canyon or something? Like, why, why there? That's another spooky detail. On April the 24th, 1964... <laughs> Another 24th. Uh, <laughs> it's weird. I don't know. On April the 24th, 1964, police officer Lonnie Samora was chasing a speeding car outside the city of Socorro in the New Mexico desert when he was alerted by a loud noise and a bright flame. In the it sounds like a flare. It sounds like someone's shooting a flare gun or there's like... Like a firework about to go off? The sky. Believing it to be an explosion, he broke off the chase and drove towards the light to investigate. The flame was blue and orange and appeared to be descending towards the ground about half a kilometer away. I learned in science that blue flames are the hottest. Mm -hmm. Knowledge. <laughs> After a and appeared to be descending towards the ground about half a kilometer away. After a difficult drive through the rough terrain, he noticed a white and silver colored object some two- They're all white and silver. It, or every kind of uh, sighting that he's gone over has been, if it's a UFO or a flying saucer, it's been white and gray with some of them having gold on them. I mean, it, it makes you think they're all like natural or like metal. Or so. They're all made of metal some kind. 200 meters distant. Sorry, it noticed everyone. a white okay. and silver colored object some 200 meters distant. It initially appeared to be an overturned car and he could see two men in white coveralls standing beside it. The two men seemed alarmed by Samora's presence and looked straight at him, but after clearing a small hill which momentarily obstructed his view, the two men had vanished. Samora oh, could not you saw an alien. <laughs> discern that it wasn't a car, but some kind of elliptical object supported by four metallic legs. The one. Oh my God, that's exactly how uh, spacecrafts, especially like extraterrestrial, extraterrestrial ones, are depicted in cartoons and you know the main like TV shows and stuff. Oh, man. The ellipsoid was about five meters in diameter and had a red insignia printed on the side. He then proceeded on foot and was about 30 meters away 
when he heard loud thumps as if someone closed a door and then a smokeless flame reminiscent of a welding torch suddenly erupted beneath the craft. The flame was once again blue and orange in color and it produced the same roaring sound that was increasing in frequency. Ever so slowly the object began to rise. At this point Zamora became frightened and the loud noise gave him the impression that the UFO was about to explode so he ran for cover behind his car. Surprised he didn't shit himself. <laughs> but after a while the UFO went completely silent and was now hovering some six meters above the ground. Its speed gradually increased until it disappeared into the distance. Oh my gosh, dude. While Samora- The thing is, regardless of if this is like real or some guy just being a nitwit and just recounting a story that never happened, like what else could that be? You know, what else it's is, is shape looks like that, sounds like that and moves like that. Like it's not even- you know, and if that was a person and they just crashed something, it would be, hey, can you get us some help? Because he was a police officer, so... Uh, I don't know. I, I'm hoping this is fake, but if it's not, I don't know. I, I want some bloody concrete evidence. I was the only person to observe the craft up close. A number of witnesses had independently reported sightings of an oval-shaped UFO and a bluish flame before the story had reached the press. One particular witness had observed the descent of an oval-shaped UFO and a police car chasing after it. A oh, police... see bro, that makes me think it's real and it's so spooky. Oh, just make contact, but hey, I'm an alien. I'll be on. <laughs> like, just speak every language. The officer arrived within minutes and both the FBI and the Air Force would soon converge upon the site. The supposed landing site was thoroughly investigated and photographed. Grass and bushes had been burnt and were still smoldering when the first officers arrived at the scene. Still smoldering when they- Bro, see how do you explain that, bro? Oh, this is giving me the heebie-jeebies. <laughs> Some of the burnt plants were notoriously difficult to set aflame. The investigators also uncovered four wedge-shaped indentations in the ground, and they appeared to be fresh as the dry topsoil had oh. been pushed aside, revealing the still moist subsoil. Okay, this is easily the most interesting uh, case he's gone over. Like, this is this is what most people picture alien encounters to be like, at least, like, uh, one that would actually happen. A cluster of footprints were also discovered within the rectangular region of the indentation. Did they have three toes? No. <laughs> they, did they have like little frog legs? Helicopters had been in the vicinity. Uh, the insignia on the craft could not be identified. The site was not radioactive. Radar had not picked up any unusual activity, nor did the soil samples collected from the landing site reveal any evidence of chemical propellants. Some claim that vitrified sand had been collected, which is when extreme heat melts sand into glass. However, others refute this claim, so it's difficult to know for certain. That would be nutty. Imagine, like, having it s your, your craft being so hot that it literally turns sand to glass. <laughs> Nevertheless, none of the investigators believed it to be a hoax. The cluster of footprints were localized and did not lead away from the indentations. Assuming Samora created indentations himself and somehow managed to ignite the near inflammable vegetation, he must have done so without leaving any evidence or footprints except for a small cluster near the center. But nah, you just wouldn't though, would you? You wouldn't that you wouldn't just carry all of that in a police car. You wouldn't just piss around with that kind of stuff, surely. Samora was deemed highly reliable by everyone who knew him, but more importantly by those who interrogated him. Despite plenty- Oh, see bro, like, that makes me think he didn't do it. Like, oh my god. ...the of opportunities to do so, he never capitalized on the sighting, nor did he seem to appreciate the attention the story attracted. Because he could have been shut down. Some government officials who knew the, know the truth could have gone to him and be like, hey, we'll pay you a lot of money if you say nothing, or if you say something, we'll kill you. Like, ah, uh, this is... This is freaky as... No evidence of a hoax has ever been uncovered, and Samora's integrity remained intact until his death many decades later. Oh, the Project Blue Book investigation... And, like, think about it. Imagine if you were, like... He lived in this day and age, and this happened. Like, he'd just pull out his phone and record it, or he'd be like, Hey, what's up, YouTube? Today I'm going to be looking at these creepy little people who came out of this unidentified object. 
it, it makes it doesn't add until up. his death many decades later. Sorry for pausing so much, by the way. The Project Blue Book investigation <laughs> failed to reach a conclusion. The most plausible Convenient. explanation seemed to be that Lonnie Samora had witnessed some kind of classified experimental aircraft, an explanation favored by the local population as well as Samora himself. Given that the highly secretive military testing range no, no, I highly doubt that because why didn't the people say like, look, you're not meant to be here or, and he, <coughs> sorry, he said they looked nervous or like shocked by his, him witnessing it. I don't know, man, it doesn't seem right. It does, mm. It's known as the White Sands Proving Grounds. It's located right next door. This is certainly a possibility. Yeah, it's the most like reasonable explanation but i mean still aliens <laughs> however the unusual design and advanced capabilities of the craft observed it still makes it difficult to believe yeah what was this 1964 it's like they're not there's not an abundance of technology like unsurprisingly well there's obviously a lot of technology don't get me wrong but like it's not anywhere near that it is now like there's no way man the military denied the existence of such a craft well, there you go, bro. Like, oh, sorry. This is a really, this is one of the more, like, interesting. Maybe it's been a while since I've reacted to Let Me Know, but this is blowing my socks off. I don't even have socks on. Many years uh, later. They blew them off before I even started. Later, <laughs> the Air Force captain in charge of the investigation recalled a strange phone call he'd received at the time. A high-ranking military official at the Pentagon had called and personally questioned him about the case, which he found to be highly unusual. He thought it was mm. unconventional for a colonel to be making such a call, and so he wondered, why in the world were they so interested? Because you weren't meant to witness it, brother. Ah, oh, that's freaky as, man. What you got next, big chieftain? Let me know. Why is it that even though half the global population walks around with a high-resolution camera in their pocket, high-resolution footage of flying saucers seem to be non-existent? Mm. I've seen variations of this line of reasoning before, and at first glance it may seem quite decisive. While it is true that cameras are more readily accessible and video quality has improved significantly over the past few decades, so has the quality of forgeries. Thanks to software like After Effects, almost anyone can create a convincing forgery, which means that videos like these will never be the definitive proof they likely would have been a few decades ago. Yeah, that's the problem, bro. Anyone can fake anything nowadays, and he's right. Like, if, if a really well-edited video came out, you know, in the 70s, then everyone would believe it. Imagine an ideal situation for a moment. Imagine that a reliable individual with no background in visual effects and no previous interest in UFOs captures an actual unidentifiable aircraft on a high resolution camera. Not <laughs> That's the thing, it seems unbelievable that all that would happen. So that leads a lot of people to believe that they're all just fake. Some blob of pixels as if it was filmed by a Japanese adult film studio, nor some <laughs> indiscernible streak that requires CSI-esque enhancements, but yeah. an actual clearly distinguishable craft that defy all conventional explanations. Even then, the authenticity of that footage would inevitably come into question, and it would in all likelihood be impossible to prove that it actually happened. I remember back in 2011, a UFO in Jerusalem was captured on video Oof. by multiple people from multiple vantage points. The case attracted worldwide attention, and the multiple locations lent credence to the sighting's authenticity. However, some time later, a team of journalists tracked down the cameraman responsible and found that one was a filmmaker and film teacher, while the others just so happened to be students at the same school. Nah. Drones have also made it far too easy to stage UFO sightings. Strange lights in the dark night sky performing seemingly impossible maneuvers, <laughs> drones got you covered. Yep. What appears to be a solid craft in the clear blue sky that looks nothing like a conventional drone Drones got you covered. It's become yeah. Drones used to just have like the four or two propeller, not propellers, but like 
arms that would just float around, but now they have many different shapes. Next to impossible to eliminate conventional explanations as virtually every person on the planet has gained easy access to the heavens above. Yep. At this point, nothing short of a spaceship landing in the middle of Times Square should be deemed convincing. This yeah. is at least in part why I chose to focus my attention on older cases, as none of these problems existed a few decades ago. That's the, the thing, that's the way to go. The first director of Project Blue Book, Edward J. Ruppelt, would later go on to write a book about the cases he and his team investigated. In it, he describes a drastic shift in the attitude towards UFO research following the rejection of the extraterrestrial hypothesis. The Air Force no longer sought to understand the nature of UFOs, but rather sought to debunk the phenomenon at large. In his own words, everything was being evaluated on the premise that UFOs could not exist. No matter what you see or hear, don't believe it. Following the aforementioned Washington DC incident in 1952, this predisposition was only reinforced. Investigators were instructed to focus on cases they could solve and to never discuss the unknowns in public. The uh, subject was to be debunked and ridiculed, and so it was. What had initially thing, been bro. perceived as a potential threat to national security had now, through an orchestrated public relations campaign, been reduced to a socially unacceptable pseudoscience. Ruppelt writes in his book, this change in the operating policy of the UFO project was so pronounced that I, like so many other people, wondered if there was a hidden reason for the change. Was it actually an attempt to go underground to make the project more secretive? Was it an effort to cover up the fact that UFOs were proven to be interplanetary and that this should be withheld from the public at all costs to prevent the mass panic? Maybe I was just playing the front man a big cover-up. Hmm. Rumpold is of course just speculating, but given that he was the head of the operation, it does make you wonder if there may have been some truth behind those concerns. Assuming the military is lying, then how does one distinguish a lie about alien spaceships from a lie about classified aircrafts? We know nothing of either, so the two deceptions would appear identical. I mean, I, I want to believe, but I'm just not sure what I'm supposed to believe in. Yeah, I'm with you there, Matt. After working my way through a few hundred cases, I feel even more conflicted than I did when I began. Oh. Things were just so much simpler then. I could just laugh at a man pretending to be scared of a Halloween mask. No grand conspiracies, no extraterrestrials, none of that. Just mortal fear and a piece of plastic. Simpler times. <laughs> yeah, man. And that was it. Wow. That was incredible. That was the unknowns, mystifying UFO cases. Oh, all right. Let me know what you think. If, if there is ever a video to comment on, I think I said this in the last video, but I really mean it. This fascinates me. As a blind person, I would never be able to sight a UFO. Um, so, you know, not very cool. But, you know, let me know your thoughts in the comments. Have you seen this video? You probably have since you're watching a reaction on it. But let me know if you've had any encounter with a UFO. Anything unexplainable that you think could be linked to aliens or a UFO. Um, are there any other cases that are unknown by you know, the majority of the public in the US military. Let me know all of your thoughts on this topic in the comments and obviously join the community. Leave a subscribe. Uh, turn on that notification bell because it is the best way to keep up to date with all the videos that I post uh, pretty much daily now because I'm off school uh, now so I have way more f uh, free time to do videos. So thank you very much for, uh, you know, watching. It has been a very fun documentary and I might just crack on with more let me know videos if any more music or anything else comes out uh from the channels i have notifications on for then i will do re uh, reactions to them but for now i'm just going to keep cracking on with these uh let me know documentaries because you guys love them i love them uh and yeah i've been chaser blank rex make sure you leave your thoughts in the comments below and leave a like tell a friend uh yeah follow me on instagram at chyznz and join my discord all of the links in the description below thank you very much for watching i've been chaser blank rex Peace out.